welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. Come on, everybody. Stand to your feet and let's go before the Lord. I'm going to get down on my knees. Father, I just come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, glory, and all the honor. We thank you, Father, that... Yeah, you are going to bless us today. We welcome you, Holy Spirit, as the teacher of the church. Come and build us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, give you the glory, give you all the honor. Now, Lord, how good it is to be in the house of the Lord. We're so amazingly grateful today. We're just thankful for being here. Lord, bless all the churches that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, our brothers and sisters, and our Baptist brothers and sisters, and Lutherans and Methodists, Episcopalian and Charismatics and Pentecostals and Calvary Chapels and Harvest, No Valley and Oasis and Inland Christian Center, the Assemblies of God, Four Square Denomination, Lord. We're just so grateful. We thank you for Trinity, Emmanuel Baptist Ecclesia Church. We thank you for the way. We thank you, Lord, for San Bernardino Temple. Lord, at no time, we, no time do we think of ourselves better. Lord, we ask you to bless them. Bless our Catholic brothers and Advent, Adventist brothers and sisters. At no time do we see ourselves as better than them. We see ourselves as co-laborers, workers together in one field, building one kingdom, not a man's, but yours. And God will give you the praise, give you the glory, give you all the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we all say amen. amen. Thank you, chaplain. Well, as you take your seat, I want you to go ahead and go with me somewhere where you haven't been in a long time. I was just kidding. <laughs> Fifth chapter, verse number nine of Hebrews. Uh, just to give you some kind of an insight to why we keep doing this and go into this verse, because the verse has so much to say about you. You know, when you come to church, you'll find out about God. That's great. You come to church, you ought to find out about you, also where you're at and what God expects from you. When you come to church, you find out not only how to do things, the way to do things, and how to live life. You see, quite frankly, I say this all the time, but I want to say it again for you. This is the manual on how to do life. It's been preserved for you for thousands of years at the cost of many people's lives. A lot of blood has been spilled so that you get the word of God. This tells you how to have a great relationship with God and from that great relationship with God how to do what God would have you to do. Be what God has called you to be. When you find out what to do and you apply it in your life, you get blessed. Your family prospers, your home prospers, your finances prosper, your business prospers. You become a witness to a lost and dying world about the goodness, glory, if you will, the goodness of God. And that's what this is really all about. In order to get this inside of you, we do everything we can to make it as simple as understanding as possible. A syllabus method of study where you hear and see is a wonderful way of understanding the word of God. But even better yet, we like to compartmentalize our thoughts, which makes it very easy. And then we add numbers to them, like number one, number two, number three, so you can follow and understand quickly. Most people understand easily that way. Why? So that you can apply them in your marriage, home, family, children, finances, dream, vision, destiny, and purpose of life, so that why you can be successful. God loves you. There's no ifs, ends, or buts about it. My friends, God died for you. No one else has ever died for you. No one else has ever gone to the cross. No devil in hell has ever gone to the cross and paid the price for you. Jesus Christ did. He proved his love with his life. He proved his love by what he does and what he has done. And therefore, all of us that are in here need to understand that God cares about you. God cares about your future. There is a purpose. There is a destiny that God has. There is, if you will, a plan that God has for your life. Most people that call themselves Christians have no concept of the plan that God has for their life. They just live out life to whatever they think it ought to be when, in fact, God has a plan and purpose for your existence on this planet. And we're learning how 
to apply the word of the Lord as we understand it. Today, this is part number two of proof of our believing. We found out that last week as we went to a fee of Hebrews, the fifth chapter, verse number nine, that it was a powerfully interesting verse. It said more than most people realized. So let's take a look at the verse together and let's talk about it in review of just a little bit of last week. I'm only going to review a few moments of it. You ought to get the CD in the depths of it so you can understand it better. The verse starts off by saying, and having been perfected, speaking of Jesus Christ, he became, notice the capital H in the word he, meaning Jesus, he became author of eternal salvation. There is no squams with anybody, no contradictions with anybody. We all agree that Jesus Christ is the author of eternal salvation. We all say amen to that. We all understand he's talking about Jesus. He is the author of eternal salvation. If you want to get saved and live forever, you better hook up with Jesus. If not, you're not going to make it because you can't make it any other way. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. He is the author, speaking of Jesus. The funny part about the verse is what goes on to say, and it's an amazing part, to all who obey him. Why didn't it say to all who believe in him? Because we know in order to in, get ourselves in a spot of eternal salvation, we're going to have to believe in Jesus Christ. Why did he not say believe, but he put the word obey in there? Obeying is the product of what you believe. Do you remember what we were talking about? The very proof of your believing in what you do is in what you do. You cannot just say something and not do something. What you do makes a bigger statement than what you say. And we said this last week that words talk is cheap. We've all known people in our life to say a lot of things but never follow through. What you do is what you believe. So when you are obedient because you desire to be obedient because you have a love relationship with him, then that brings you to a deepest part of believing. And Paul said it like this. He said, I will show you what I believe or my faith by what I do. And so therefore it's important for us to see that this word uh, if you will, obeying means an awful lot to all of us. We saw three things last week. Let me just quickly review those. Number one, obedience reveals our belief. It talks about where we're at. You know, what we do is what we really believe. Number two, we found out that deep belief calls to deep obedience. You cannot just say, I love God a whole lot. He's my everything. He's my all in all. And keep living the life that you think instead of the life that he desires. Number three, we found out that obedience brings us to eternal rewards. An eternal reward is sometimes overlooked by the church. We need to realize that every one of us in this room are going to die, we're going to pass from this earth. You're never going to take one single thing with you. You're not going to take your bank account. You're not going to take your checking account. You're not going to take all the awards you've ever won or all the degrees you've ever had. When you leave this place, you were born naked and you will leave naked. And most likely, if you have gold in your teeth before you hit the box and they drop you in the ground, someone will extract the gold from your teeth when you're not looking. Are you listening? <laughs> and I want you to know something. So we're all going to be in this place of realizing what's important is the eternal and not just the time period that we live here on earth. And that is truly, if you will, uh, something that we get by obedience and there's eternal rewards along with obedience. Today, I want to talk to you about some interesting points that God gave me. What it takes to truly be obedient. Now, let me just emphasize the word truly. What it takes to truly be obedient. I can be obedient and not truly be obedient. Let me say it again. I can be obedient and not truly be obedient. In other words, I could do it because someone makes me do it. I could do it because I, I, it's what I do, but I hate doing it. You know, in other words, I can go to church, but not go to church. 
Because I go to church with the right attitude of going to church. I don't have to go to church. I get to go to church. And there's a difference between someone who has to go and someone who wants to go. So true obedience, instead of it has a depth to it, has a feeling, has an appreciation and behind it with God. And so we take a look at this. And there's four things that God gave me. Uh, I think you'll find all of them fascinating. Now listen closely to what I'm going to say. Why is it that I want you to understand what it's going to take to truly be obedient? Why is it that I'm making this point? Why is it that you need to know what it's going to take for you to truly be obedient? Here's why. Because when you get out of yourself, out of your own understanding, out of your own ways of doing things, and get into his ways of doing things, you get blessed. We all have our own ideologies. We all have our own philosophies. We all have our own insights and things that we feel are right or wrong, but that doesn't make it right or wrong. What's right is what God says. We got those feelings, we got those choices back in the garden with Adam and Eve partaking of the tree of knowledge of good and of evil. At that time, we now make decisions for ourselves and those decisions that we make for ourselves, listen to me, are not necessarily right, nor will they bring you to a place of blessing. So God who loves you wants to take you out of doing it your way into doing it his way. You will never do it his way and get out of your way until you know what his ways are. Are you following me? And we look for scripture to find out what it is because it's the inspired word of God. Four things this morning, if you will, on what it's going to take to truly be obedient. Number one, are you ready? Willingness. There's got to be a willingness on the inside of us. That's where we're okay with it. That's where we're not resistant to it. That's where we come along and it becomes a favorable thing that we want to do in our life. A willingness says, I want to do it. A willingness has an attitude that I, that's something important to me. That's something I want to adapt to. It's something I want to bring into my life. It's a willingness instead of an opposite of resistance, instead of an opposite that says, I refuse, uh, I'm not going to do that. It's absolutely something that inside of your heart that says, I am willing to do it. There will never be obedience that needs to be done let me say it again. There will never be obedience that needs to be done until first there's a willingness that comes forth from the heart that says, wow, I'm not resisting this. I want this. I'm in favor of it. I like the idea. I'm okay with it. I want to be part of it. I want it to work in my life. I see the importance of it, and I'm willing to make the changes. I'm willing to get involved. I'm willing to do. And without willingness, it really doesn't happen at all. I'm going to take you to a verse. I hope you have your Bible. If you don't have your Bible, I'll put it up on the overhead for you, but get smart. Getting smart means you bring your Bible. Let's mark up on that Bible right in there. Learn where it's at. Do you know why? Because mm, I'm not going to be around all the time when the world's going to put its pressure on you. You can't call me on the phone. You know, the older I get, the earlier I go to bed. Guess what? You call me after nine now. I'm still awake at nine o'clock, but probably next year, 8.30, that's it, man. And so you want to get your Bible and find out what the word of the Lord has to say. So we're talking about willingness. Let's go, if you will, to the scripture, Isaiah, the first chapter, verse number 19. Let's take a look at it together. It says these words, if, biggest little word in the Bible. When you see the word if, it means there's an option. That means you could do it or not do it. If means it's your call. I love people that come along and say, oh God, make me do this. Oh God, make me do that. I want you to know something. God's not in to make you do anything. This is something that comes out of your heart because you are willing and obedient. If your choice, your call, you are willing and obedient. I want you to notice before obedience comes the word willing. 
There will always be willing before there's obedience. Are you following me? There will always be willingness before there's obedience. So you'll want to do it. You'll have to because it comes from the heart. And then he has a promise that follows it. I love promises, don't you? I love promises if they're good promises. Did you know there's some promises in the Bible I don't like so much at all, but they're wise promises. Watch this, if you will. Here comes the promise after the commitment. Here he says, if you're willing and obedient, you shall eat of the good of the land. God says, I'll promise you, I'll take care of you, I'll provide for you. You will eat not just of the land, you'll not just get by, but you're going to eat of the good of the land. I'm talking, there's that which comes from the land, and then there's the good of the land. We would call it like this, the fat part. You will eat of the fat of the land. But listen, that's a promise that's a good promise. But let's go to verse 20 just for fun and let's see what happens when there's resistance to obedience. Verse number 20 comes along and says it like this. But if you refuse and rebel. You know, a lot of times we refuse to do what's right. We don't want to get in and do it. We refuse to act the way we should as husbands or act the way we should as wives or take care of our kids a certain way and deal with them according to what Scripture says instead of what the world says and deal with our boss or deal with gossip or deal with stuff. If we refuse to do what God would have us to do, and then he comes along and he says, you shall be devoured by the sword. You know, that's an interesting thing because the next verses are very important. Next part of this verse, it says, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. When you read in your Bible, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken, you know what he just said? This is a promise. This is a now a law. You know, God's unchangeable and that law goes into effect. This is the way it has to be. If you do what you should be doing and you're willing and be obedient to it, you're going to get blessed. If you refuse, you're going to fail and be eaten up by the sword. And God said that's the way it is. In other words, can I just say this to you? In the New Testament, it says it like this. What you sow, you reap. And there's a law of sowing and reaping. You sow junk you get junk. You sow good, you get good. You sow blessings, you get blessings. You sow God, you get God. Come on, somebody. (laughs) Number one, we're talking about what's it take to be truly obedient is willingness. Number two, I love this, humbleness. Humbleness, and we've talked about it a lot lately at this church. That means that you take the back seat. You know, I'll put it in terms like this. You let God drive and you get in the back seat. (laughs) I I, I, I want you to know something. If I I saw a bumper sticker one time that said, God is my co-pilot. Can I tell you something? If God's your co-pilot, change places. You know what I'm saying? Don't have that on your car. God's not your co-pilot. He is the pilot, and you're the (laughs) co-pilot. It's got to be the other way around. And we forget that all the time, don't we? And we need to be people that when God's driving, we're submissive to that. And that's what humility is all about. I can't be humble without being submissive to whoever's driving. If God's taken me somewhere, I know it's good. If God's taken me somewhere, I know I'm blessed. I know if God's going to do something and bring me somewhere that I don't understand, but I know that God does understand it, takes me through something that I don't understand. Can I tell you something? I know it's okay. Why? Because he's in control. Why do I want him to be in control? Because he wants to bless me wherever I go and whatever I do. Now, it may be hard times getting to the blessing. There may be difficult times getting to the blessing, but I'm here to tell you something. God is one who's going to take those hard times. We go through the valley of the shadow of death, and we don't camp in it, stay in it. We go through it and come out on the other side. You know, I, 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 let me give you an illustration of humility. I love to drive I just think it's wonderful when I drive, and Deborah sits with us. She's not here, so I'll tell you a story. It's okay. She's, she's in the back doing some work, and uh, uh, I'll just tell you a story. I love driving, but every now and then, she kind of gets bored, and she likes to drive, and I got to let her drive. I could just drive all day. I just, you know, I should have been a truck driver or something. I, I don't know. I just love to drive, and uh, uh, Deborah sits there and gets bored. 
And so every now and then I'll say, you want to drive? She said, yeah, sure. And I'll, I'll put her in. Oh, my goodness sakes. She is like a driver. You don't, I can't even tell you what it's like. You know, she just said to me after the last service, you know, I've never been in an accident. Well, you've never been caught, girl. You've wiped out all, you've wiped out all of our fences, garages, wiped out everything. Your car is full of dents right now. I mean, she got broken mirrors, everything. When you, get, when you get in her car, here's what she does. She got very bad depth perception. She admits it. She says, I'm not sure if that truck's coming at me or going away from me. I said, Mama, my God, it's in another lane. <laughs> and, and, and so, but I have to learn how to let her have control. And she, real jerky like this, you know. So she says, are you resting? I'm going... <laughs> Jerking me around. Can you just like go easy like this? You know, what are you gonna go like that fast for? You know, and it's just like I'm amazing. So I'm learning how that when I give her control to trust that I'm gonna get where I need to go. <laughs> and it's the same thing with God. The difference when you give God control, He won't jerk you around. <laughs> Come on, somebody. And we're talking about humility. Let me pop this up on the overhead for you. Uh, uh, Philippians, the second chapter, verse number eight, is kind of a cool verse. Watch this. Now listen, we're talking about Jesus. Watch Jesus here. Now listen to this. It says, and being found in the appearance as a man, Jesus. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And notice these words. He humbled himself and became obedient to he humbled himself and became obedient. Now, here's the point that a lot of people miss. Humility, you do not want God to humble you. Wait a minute. The dumbest prayer you could ever pray. Is anybody listening? The dumbest, I'm talking about dumb. I'm talking about I like what John Wayne said. It's hard enough living in this planet, but when you're stupid, you're really going to be hard. I mean, the stupidest prayer you can, oh God, humble me. You do not want God to humble you. <laughs> humble yourself. And notice this, when the humility comes, where you take the back seat, get out of yourself and get into him, and you have to take the back seat, get out of yourself and get into him to get into the blessings, his blessings. You have to take the back seat and let him guide. You have to take the back seat and humble yourself and let him live. Let him live through you, his plan, his will, his purpose. If it's still all about you. I told Deborah yesterday, coming to church to preach the gospel. Can you imagine this? I said to her, I said, man, it's taken a lot of years to get me out of the way. Then she said, little smart aleck, God's not finished with you yet. <laughs> what is that all about? <laughs> we ought to get out of the way, and that's what humility is all about, and put God first in order for God to do what he needs to do. And here you see Jesus getting his own ideologies as a man, his own ideas, feelings, and flesh out of the way to get, in order to get into what the Father says. When you hear me, you hear the Father. When you see me, you've seen the Father. Words that I speak are not my words, but he that sent me. Wow, powerful understanding. We're talking about what it takes to be truly obedient. These are things that we can apply in our life. I like number three is one of my favorites. It's awareness. Awareness. I need to be aware of where I'm at with God. My frailties, my shortcomings, my abilities, where I'm strong, where I'm weak, what I can do, what I can't do, what I should do. Uh, I mean, like for an example, if I'm an alcoholic, I should be so aware that I should not work in a bar. <laughs> if I'm a drug addict, what am I doing hanging around drug dealers? If I'm into pornography, what am I doing watching the internet? In other words, you can never change where you're at and be obedient to what God would have you to do until you are aware of who you are. Is anybody listening? The other day, last Monday, in fact, Debbie and I went to San Diego. We went to museums down in San Diego. 
got in for like 12 bucks each because we're both senior citizens. That was pretty cool. You know, we're past the age, I'm never, I'm never gonna do that discount. Oh yeah, give me the discount, man. <laughs> so got in, you know, and we're going through the museum. And in the museum, there's a chocolate expedition. Exposit. Expo what? Exposition. Is that the right word? Yeah, exposition, yeah. There's a, cho there's a chocolate expo. And so uh, we go in, and we start learning about chocolate. Now, that's not a bad thing. You say, well, what's wrong with that? Well, we're both fasting. <laughs> Debbie's fasting sugar. She says, oh, I can do it. We go in, and they not only tell you the history of chocolate. Did you know there used to be chocolate houses just like there are coffee houses? You know, Starbucks is just what they used to have, hot chocolate, and all through, and they had a cup of chocolate, had two little handles on each side, and it went all over the world, and I know the whole history of chocolate, and all the time I'm in there for like 30 minutes, there's this incredible smell of chocolate. <laughs> Finally, we get through, and you can't eat anything in there, so we figure, okay, but they dump us out in a, in a, in a, in a place that's selling chocolate, you gotta walk through. And I, Debbie says, you want a chocolate bar? I said, yeah. <laughs> Listen to this, true story. I paid 11 bucks for a chocolate bar. <laughs> Who pays 11 bucks for a chocolate bar? It wasn't even good. I should have got a Hershey's. Oh no, man, 20 minutes of smelling and having no, being on a diet, being on a fast, and, 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 and breaking it right then and there. We ate that sucker before we got out of the store. <laughs> Awareness. <laughs> Never go into a chocolate expo when you are fasting. <laughs> True story. The whole thing is becoming aware of who we are, our frailties and our lifestyles, so that we don't get caught. Because I'm telling you, at every turn of the road, there's something to trap you, keep you from being obedient with the things of the Lord. Now watch this. I'm going to take you to Romans, the sixth chapter. Let's take a look at it. Just pop it up, verse number 12, Romans. Therefore, and the word therefore, remember, it's all because of what he said first 11 chapter verses, which is amazing and powerful, and you ought to just take your time and read it. But let's just start for the sake of awareness in verse number 12. Do not let. See the words do not let means it's your option. Do not let means, and he, some people come along and they've got this unbelievable, immature evaluation of Scripture that says this verse don't belong to us because we're under grace and this would never apply to us. And that is totally immature evaluation of scripture, which is, comes up about every 20 years. But it says that therefore do not let meaning, he's writing to believers, it's your option, it's your choice. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you obey the lust of it. In other words, I, I gotta be aware of the fact that I could sin. I could operate in something contrary to the ways of God. I could make a mistake and do something. So I have an option. The option is if God says, don't do it, that means he's gotta give me the power to not do it. And I have to realize that by, by the power of the Holy Spirit that dwells on the inside of us, that I have now the power not to do the sin. Stop and think about it. God tells you what to do, how to do it, warns you for the pitfalls, and then fills you with the Holy Ghost that gives you the power so you don't have to do that. What makes a mistake is when people come along and they say, I'm just part of me. It's just the way it is. It's ingrained in me. My mother, my father did that. It's the way it was in my family. and It's just the way I am. My mother was this way. My father was this way. I'm that way. Can I tell you something? That's not true. You got the power of the Holy Ghost on the inside of you, and you can change that, and you don't have to let sin run your life. 
Verse number 13 comes along and says these words. He says, and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. In other words, there's an option there. You don't have to do it. But present your members, oh, here's what God wants you to do, to God as, a, as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Now, obviously, he's writing to the church because no one's alive from the dead unless they have been born of the Spirit of God. So he's talking to the church. In other words, awareness is, is that I could make mistakes. I could sin. I could let the wrong things in my life. I could have things operating in my life that keep me from the blessings of God. But I have an option here and the option is I can do what God would have me to do. I may not do it right off the bat, but if I keep working at it, I'm going to win and it's going to lose. Somebody give me an amen. Verse number 14 comes along and he says this, for sin shall not have dominion over you. Why? For you are not under the law, but under grace. Can I just say something to you? Why in the world would he make a statement like that? He's trying to tell you, you can get free if you want to be free. You can live the kind of life you want to live. You need to be obedient to the things of God because God's given you the power to do it. You don't have to let something that's ugly run your life when you can let something that's righteous run your life. You don't have to operate in things that'll kill you. You can operate in things that'll bring you Life. There's a difference now that you are born of the Spirit of God. Which brings us to verse number 15. What then shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? Heck no. Verse number 16. It says, do you not know that whom you present yourselves slaves to obey? You are one who ser- is one slave whom you obey? In other words, he just made a statement, you don't have to do this. Now he's telling you, if you do it, you become a slave to it. I don't know about you, but oftentimes I will do it, become a slave to it. When I didn't have to do it, I could have been free by the power of the Holy Spirit that gave it to me. That's the point he's making. What's he trying to say? Awareness of who you are, what rights you have, awareness of what's going to be your trap, awareness of what your good points are and what your bad points are, awareness of where your strengths are, where your shortcomings are, awareness, something that keeps you from being where you need to be so you don't end up in a chocolate expo on your dieting day. (laughs) Whether in sin leading to death, Or obedience leading to righteousness. Verse number 17, watch this. But God has thanked, God be thanked that through you we're slaves to sin, yet you obeyed from the heart. And that's what this is all about, is obeying from the heart. You obeyed from the heart, form of doctrine in which you were delivered. Verse 18. And having been set free from sin, and you have because it wouldn't ask you not to operate in sin if you weren't set free from sin. God had to set you free from sin, and it's only by choice you let sin continue. It's only by choice you let it keep going. It's only by choice that you... See, it's not about God or not at this point. It's about your choices, my choices. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Someone ought to give me a great big amen on that one. See, knowing and being aware of who we are, our shortcomings and our frailties and the things that are out to trap us and if we're trapped, how to get back to the things of God are very important in your Christian walk. Last one for today because we're talking about a wonderful subject. The wonderful subject is what it takes to be truly obedient. Last one is wholeheartedness. And I know it's two words, wholeheartedness, but it can be one word here because it's all about one thing. Whatever you do in the area of obedience, do it with all of your heart unto the Lord. Don't do it half-hearted. Don't do it questioning. Do it with all of your heart. And God really says there's tremendous blessings when you're wholehearted towards the things of the Lord. Let me put up a last verse, Deuteronomy 26, verse number 16. Deuteronomy 26, if you want to turn it in your Bible. Deuteronomy 26, verse 16 says this. This day the Lord your God commands you to observe these statutes and judgments. You know, sometimes people want to come along and say, well, that's the Old Testament. We're talking about a God who doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now listen to me. 
In the New Testament, we have letters that are written to us that are the epistles. That is for the church that's born of the Spirit of God. That's why we're always in the New Testament in the epistles. But that doesn't mean you throw out the character, nature, and attributes of God from the Old Testament. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. By the way, that's a New Testament quote, not just an Old Testament quote. And the way we approach God and the way we see God and act with God always stays the same, except we now approach God with great faith because the Spirit of the Lord lives on the inside of us. This day the Lord your God commands you to observe these statutes and judgments. Therefore you shall be careful to observe them with all of your heart and with all of your soul. My goodness sakes, with all of your heart and with all of your soul. With all of your heart and with all of your soul. With all of your heart, it's a wholeheartedness with all of your soul, not just an occasional thought, but with everything. And guess what? God will make your way clean. God will make your way fresh. God will lead you to blessing. God will take you to the, your own personal promised land. God will do great, mighty, marvelous things. Now watch this, verse number 17. Let me just pop it up for you. Today you have proclaimed to the Lord your God and that you will walk in his ways and keep his statutes. That's called obeying his commandments and his judgments, and that you will obey his voice. And if you keep reading, there's blessings waiting for those who obey the voice of the Lord. Four things today God spoke to us that's easy for us to adapt in our life and to check ourselves out from time to time and what it takes to be truly obedient. Number one, willingness, not resistant to the things of God. Number two, Humbleness, when we put him in the driver's seat of our life for every decision-making process that we have. Number three, awareness. We know who we are, our shortcomings, our frailties, where we're at, what we're doing, where we're going, and the attacks that would like to come and stop us from being obedient. And number four, according to the scripture, wholeheartedness. And when you are wholehearted, God will back you and God will bless you. If you heard from God, give the Lord a great big praise. I want to make sure everybody's right with God before you leave. Is that okay? Yeah. Nothing could be worse than you walking out of this place and your heart stopped and you died and went to hell. Open your eyes in hell. And there's no coming back from hell. There's no like doing two years and get to come back as a frog. There's nowhere. <laughs> you believe people believe stuff like that. I mean, it's amazing like how stupid people can be. And so, and, and God still loves them, you know, not me, man. I'd slap them. And uh, it's uh, just amazing. So I want you to hear me now just for a moment. I want to make sure you're all right with God before you leave. Here's, let's talk. If you were to walk out of this building, your heart stopped and you died, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Answer the question in your heart. Nobody will know but you and God, but don't just stare at me. Answer the question in your heart. Now, let's talk about your answer. Your answer says a lot about where you're at and who you are with God, okay? Some of you said, well, Pastor Jim, I think that if I died, I'd go to heaven. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say you can think your way into heaven? You're not gonna make it. No positive thinkers get to go to heaven. That's not what this is about. Some of you might have said, well, I hope, Pastor Jim, I'm gonna go to heaven. I hope I, I'm gonna make it. Can I tell you something? Nowhere in the Bible say you could hope your way into heaven. Like, I hope, I hope, <laughs> whoever's the biggest hoper, I don't even know if that's a word, a hoper, you get to go to heaven, you're not going to make it. Some of you might say, Pastor Jim, wait a minute, man, you don't understand, I'm in love with God. Could you show me somewhere in the Bible where it says you're in love with God, you get to go to heaven, and everybody loves God gets to go to heaven? It's not in the Bible. Can you imagine? I would have thought it would be, but it's not. It's not in the Bible. Some of you might say, well, Pastor Jim, I'm going to go to heaven because I'm really a good person. You know, I've done anything wrong. I'm pretty good. You know, I'm here today, and, you know, I, I, I'm a pretty good person. Can I tell you something? Nowhere, listen to this. This is shocking. Nowhere, it's not in the Bible, it says you get to go to heaven because you're a good person. Did you know that's not in the Bible? It's not even in the Bible. Listen, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. You know what he just said? You can't get to heaven your way, my way, or some well-meaning church committee's way. You're going to have to get to heaven his way. He's the only way to heaven. Jesus Christ. 
And then he comes along and he tells us exactly in the scripture, exactly how to get to heaven. He says these words, John third chapter, you must be born again. Wow. You know when I say those words, born again, most people in American churches turn off because they've been trained by Hollywood to not like born again people. You know, born again people are goofy and weird and freaky and, you know, are just stupid. And guess what? Can I tell you something? That's not what Jesus is talking about in the scripture. Let me tell you what born again means from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. Here's what born again means. Because if Jesus said you have to be born again to get to heaven, then I need to realize that that's the way you get to heaven. And I need to know what it means. It means that you have given God all of your heart. It means you've given God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Always has been, my friends. Always will be, all or nothing. God forgive us in American churches for 250 years. We've watered that down and made it a service, a gathering of people to listen to some little reader's digest suggestion. I'm here to tell you something. That's not what God has. God has for you to give him all of your heart and give him all of your life. I'll prove it to you that it's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Last book in the Bible. Are you looking? Look at this. Last book in the Bible, book of Revelation, Jesus is speaking. He says, I'm coming again, and you know he is. I don't know when, but he's coming. And he says these words, and when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. That's what Jesus said, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Do you know what he really just said? He really said people who call themselves Christians that are lukewarm, are not real Christians at all. And they're not going to make it. And they're going to get vomited from the mouth of Jesus. Let me define for you so you understand, and we're all on the same page, what lukewarm is. It's a little in, it's a little out. It's a little up, it's a little down. It's a token prayer, it's occasional church attendance. You know, God is something in your life, but he's not everything. That's lukewarm. You know, you're not against God. Oh, no, you're not against him. But you're not wholehearted for him. That's lukewarm. And my friends, tonight, today, you've got to give him all of your heart. You've got to give him all of your life. Because he's not a thief to rob it from you. It's your heart and life. He's not a conniver to talk you out of a manipulator. You know, he could have made a billion robots that look just like you that all sing the praises of God, do everything just the right way. He made you just the way you are so that you can make a choice. It's all about your heart. It's all about your choosing. It's not about what you have in your head because we all know who Jesus is. We celebrate Christmas every year. Look at me now. We all have Jesus in our head. We know who he is. We celebrate Easter every year. But it's not about what you have in your head. It's about what you've done with your heart. This is all about your heart. Have you given God all of your heart? Have you given God all of your life? Today is your day of salvation. God brought you here for a reason today. God brought you here for a reason today. You may have come kicking and bawling and squalling and disliking every moment of your steps here, but you're here and you're here for a reason because today is your day of salvation. And you're going to have to do something like the rest of us did. You're going to have to give God all of your heart. You're going to have to give God all of yourself. And that's what this is all about. All of your life. You're going to have to humble yourself, get in the back seat, and start letting him be Lord of your life. That means the driver of everything. And today, it's your day of salvation. All across this auditorium, I've told you the truth. You've gotten the word today. We've clapped our hands. We've laughed. We've had a good time. We've sung songs. It's been an amazing church service for you. God spoke to you today, but don't leave this place the same. God's calling you home, and today is your day of salvation. You say, Pastor Jim, well, how do I do it? Let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear that sound, bang! Your hand goes up. I'll see your hand go up. You can put it right back down after I see your hand. You can put it right back down. What you're saying by the raising of your hand 
is I don't want Jesus in my head like most Americans. No, no. I want to give him all of my heart, give him all of my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, and denying my presence in hell. I don't want to go to hell, and I want to go to heaven. I'll see your hand go up. It's that simple. And you can put it right back down. You might say to me, Pastor Jim, wait a minute, hold on. You want me to raise my hand in public? I want you to know that people I came with will see me. I'll feel funny. I'll be embarrassed. People behind me will see me put my hand up. I'll feel funny. Yep, you will. Get over it. It's better to feel funny in a safe place like this than to be in hell forever and ever because you chose more to be concerned about what people think instead of what God sees. I don't believe anybody's that stupid. Today is your day of salvation. Today, get ready to give God all of your heart and all of your life. If you've been running from God, get ready to put your hand up. You need to run to him. If you're one of those people that have never given him all of your heart, I'm speaking to you. Get ready to put your hand up. In the family rooms, in the foyer, out of the restaurant, by television, wherever you're at in the campus that you can hear me and see me, today is your day of salvation. If you've never given him all of your life, today is your day. Get ready to put your hand up. If you're not sure that you've given him all of your heart and life, make sure today is your day. Is that okay? Here we are on this safe and friendly place. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. You get your hand up and then put it right back down. Today is your day. Are you ready? Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Man, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, two hundred, two, three, four, five, 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 six, five, seven, five, eight. Thank you. Back over on this side. Twenty-nine. Thank you. Thirty. Thirty-one. Thank you. Thirty-two. Thirty-three. Thirty-four. Thank you. Anybody else on this side? Anybody else? There's thirty-four wise people. Anybody else? Anybody else? You need to get your hand up. This is the time to do it. Thirty-four. Anybody else? Where's thirty-five? Anybody else in the family rooms? Let's give the Lord a great big praise for 34 wise people. All 34 of you. All 34, once you get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend, get your stuff. If you raise your hand, you're serious about God. I don't want anybody to leave the sanctuary right now. Let's get these people forward. If you're serious about God and you raised your hand, or if you didn't raise your hand and you know you should have, you can come too. We get in the aisle, bring a friend, bring your stuff, meet me right here in front. Hurry now, you come right now. Come on, 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 come on. Lord, I give you my heart. Come on, come on, come on, come on. I give you my soul. I'll live for you. Alone. They're coming, give them a hand as they come. Every breath that I take. Every moment I'm away. Come on, you come too. Come on. Oh Lord, have your way. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. Come on, hurry, hurry, hurry. I'll live for you alone. Every breath that I take. Well, thank God you guys have come. I think there's people still coming, but here's what we're going to do. I want to point you over here to Pastor Joel. He's going to pray with you, give you some free information to take home and read about what to do next. Tell you about a program we have called Spiritual Personal Trainer, someone to help you get strong. He'll explain all of that to you. Only takes a few moments. People you came with will wait for you. Is that okay? Make a left turn. Follow Pastor Joel right over there. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. <laughs> 